it turns out that everyone was right and Automobilista 2 has got a bit good with recent updates. To cut right to the chase, these cars drive brilliantly. The audience was looking for a modern sequel to Car Extreme and I think this more than fits the bill. The driving experience though is just a little bit tamer and a fair bit more refined. So let's dive a little deeper. So then, less extreme maybe, but for me, more car. The cars behave in a more believable way, and the most important test for me is that they look right while doing so. Sim racers seem to have this weird fetishization with the idea that high downforce open wheel cars should have knife edge handling with no mechanical grip whatsoever. And we've certainly been treated to plenty of open wheel cars that behave like this in the past, especially from modders. So it's refreshing to drive an open wheel indie car that has functional tires below 140 miles an hour. Sure, it's still powerful and there's plenty of boost to get you into trouble, especially coming out of the slow corners, but it's responsive and when treated with respect, it respects you back. In short, they're not the same hair trigger monsters as a similar car in another sim. And for me, these are the first high downforce cars I've driven in Automobilista 2 that I've really properly connected with. Though, given the frequent and extensive updates and the pause that I've had from the title, I feel I should probably go back and try out some of the older content again. Oh, and before I move on, I'm using a skin pack by Chrissy2174 from Race Department, which is a 90% complete representation of the 1998 season. Now, there's no Penske chassis in the game, so that livery has been applied to a Lola, which I think is a great compromise. So, to the pack. We have three chassis, four engines, and six combinations of car and power plant. On top of that, there's the visually stunning Cleveland circuit, as well as a nicely made version of Watkins Glen, which is undoubtedly one of the greatest racetracks in the world. And Road America will be added later in December as well. Not a bad haul for £10.99. Of course, that's not mentioning the 1995 and 2000 cars that will follow shortly as well. You really can't accuse Riser of being stingy with content. But more than that, it's exciting content. Think back to 1998. Bruce Willis is inexplicably plucked from his oil drilling job and tasked with blowing up an asteroid. Chumbawamba were unable to stay upright for any length of time, and Cart was being more than a little bit amazing at circuits all over the US. Despite being in the midst of the mountainously half-witted indie split, thanks Tony, the mid-90s were widely regarded as a high point of US open wheel racing. And it's easy to see why. 870 to 900 horsepower cars with decent but not silly F1 levels of aerodynamics, a great mix of road and oval courses, a roster of drivers that are still spoken about with reverence today, and critically, absolutely brilliant racing. And AMS2 is doing a solid job of capturing some of that magic, at least with this first batch of releases. I'll come back to the cars in a minute, but I can't go any further without mentioning Cleveland. In theory, a flat airport circuit wouldn't really rank all that highly in the excitement stakes. And if you drive around it in a practice session, it's not particularly special, at least not to begin with. Sure, it's bumpier than Sebring, the various tarmac patches have wildly varying grip levels, and the backdrop is this beautifully executed city skyline that provides a really nice change of pace from the usual sim racing fare. But jump into a race and this place changes from Paul Ricard's ugly stepbrother to a high energy racing venue that provides wheel to wheel action on a par with some of the best in the world. It's proper Jekyll and Hyde stuff. Riser have really captured the feel of the place and with the inherent immersion aiding visuals in the madness engine, it is a potent combination. At the other end of the scale is Watkins Glen, an all time great. And like the not at all similar Cleveland Airport, it's been treated with great care. This is not a simple copy and paste job from Project Cars. The layout is more accurate, as are the placings of very non-trivial items like walls, barriers and curbs, the latter of which are much more authentic. In a word, it is significantly more accurate, and that can only be a good thing. Now, back to the cars. Of the three chassis, the Reynard feels the best right out of the box. The Swift and Lola chassis do have a healthy chunk of built-in understeer that I'm sure can be dialed out with some setup work. I think I got about 75% of the way there with a few basic tweaks, so I really don't think it's something inherent to the car's design. As you would expect though, each of these three cars does handle fairly similarly. They stick well and change direction well in the fast stuff, but once the aero drops away at lower speed, you do really have to hustle the cars. This feels very right, for want of a better description. And getting back on the power in the slow stuff is something you have to do carefully and progressively, because even those big, fat, slick bolted to the rear axle are not immune to all of that power. Speaking of which, you do have adjustable boost, which is turned up to 11 by default, because the guys at Riser don't mess around. As for the four engines, they definitely have slightly different power delivery characteristics, with the Honda feeling the most potent and the Mercedes producing the most drivability. And that has contributed to making the Reynard Mercedes my go-to choice so far. In general, the cars are very drivable on high boost, if treated with a little caution. 
but slippery tarmac and rain really do make things scary quickly, so use caution. This is balanced out a little on the default setups by the gear ratios, which are longer than a Peter Jackson trilogy. To get back to my point, the default ratios are set at max, which is probably more appropriate for ovals or the Nordschleifer. This means first gear is extremely long, which is actually a bit of a blessing with all of that boost, but it's probably something you're going to want to address right away when making setups. On that note, I found that increasing the steering angle a couple of degrees really helped things as well, and although that may be less accurate to the real world cars, I found I was spending quite a lot of time with my arms crossed over, particularly on street circuits. There are a few minor gripes though, as is always the case. There does seem to be a weird scaling issue between the front monocoque and the driver model, which is only visible in the replay cameras. Either the driver is a little bit too small or the tub is too wide, and honestly I imagine most people won't notice. More noticeable, however, is the driver's hand clipping through the cockpit when shifting. Riser have a good history of sorting out issues like this, so I'm confident they'll be addressed in due course. So then, fun cars, fun circuits, and good racing to be had. The AMS2 AI is good and racy, though some work does still need to be done in wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat. There's plenty of rubbing, but it doesn't seem to cause too many issues with the player car. In fact, these cars seem to be able to take small hits without it being a world-ending event, which is really handy. AI cars colliding can sometimes get a little bit more uh, altitude when connecting on track, but it's not really been a particularly frequent occurrence to me. In general, pretty decent I'd say, with the usual caveats of slow turn one and early lap behavior that creep into most Sims AI. Overall, Racing USA, without the G, is a heaping great pile of fun. And with two more sets of cars, Oval Aero packages, and Road America still to come later on in the month, it seems like there's plenty more where that came from. Now, can someone please explain to me how it's only 10.99?